This is Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain and for healthcare professionals. I'm Paul Evans, and this edition's been funded by the Charles Wolfson Charitable Trust. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? If you think about people who, when they get nervous, can't speak, that feeds into them being unable to kind of project themselves into the world. And then when they learn through different breathing techniques and different kind of physical exercises to use their voice, that means that they can then project themselves into the world. What are we going to do? When people feel that kind of pressure to be happy, it means that when you experience non-happy states like sadness, pain, depression, anxiety, that you actually feel in some way that you're failing in your life, that you know you should be happy, we all should be happy. The British Pain Society is the largest multidisciplinary professional organisation in the field of pain within the UK. Each year they hold their annual scientific meeting, where leading experts from all over the globe share their expertise with colleagues and patient groups to the benefit of over a third of the population who live with chronic pain. So, all in all, it's a pretty serious event. Not exactly a laugh a minute. But then... My name's Sarah Sturman and I'm a physio working in the Dorset Community Pain Service. Laughter Yoga was started in 1995 by a medical doctor, Dr Madden Kataria, and basically he looked at why medicine misses out on laughter and why laughter is thought to be really medicinal and was there any science. And having found that there was a lot of science about the medicinal impact of laughter, he decided to create a form of exercise or activity that could actually bring laughter into a sort of a packaged uh, way that you could deliver it to people. You've gathered a crowd around you of, of people not wholly willing may be bulldozed into it. What are you going to do with them? It's said that laughter is contagious. It takes one or two people who are enjoying themselves, even just a smile, and naturally humans will be drawn to that and want to think, well, what is it that they know about that I don't? Why are they laughing and smiling? So there's that natural inclination to come towards uh, the lighter side of life. And so if you see a group of people laughing, it's quite hard to resist, to be honest. Um, if you've got some eye contact between the participants, it becomes even more contagious. So silliness, fun, uh, laughter, they are natural human attributes and it does tend to spread even with those who are take a bit of persuading even with cynical healthcare professionals I think so and I think there's a lot of lot less cynicism in healthcare nowadays we're becoming more human I think um, and understanding that there's more to being healthy and well than just a lack of illness I don't know if these people are coming this way maybe not are you coming this way oh yes come and have a seat Yes, come and have a seat. <laughs> have any of you heard of laughter yoga? Yes, okay. So, lots of useful quotes that you'll see in literature about laughter. You know, the general thing about everyone saying, well, laughter's the best medicine, but is it really? And throughout time, from 2,000 years ago, people were already talking about the benefits of laughter. Um, lots of literary people talking about laughter. There's not a lot of humour in medicine, but there's a lot of medicine in humour. On all of these sorts of things that we instinctively know about, various religious groups and uh, different cultural groups have, have always talked about laughter as being therapeutic. A merry heart doeth good like medicine. From Judaism, as soap is to the body, so laughter is to the soul. And then this one, which I think is really nice. We don't stop playing because we're old, but we grow old because we stop playing. So this idea of laughter's good for us, laughter's good for us, laughter and playfulness, they're really the same thing. And we don't do as much of it as an adult. Is it because we're grown? No, it's probably not. We grow old and we think differently because we're not engaging in that childlike playfulness. So is there any truth to this phrase about laughter's the best medicine? Well, there is, you know, we all feel it. We all feel if we've had a good belly laugh, that physiologically, or it can be quite exhausting. So we know it does things physiologically to us. And there's a lot of researchers that have gone a lot further and really just taken that phrase, laughter's the best medicine, and said, well, is it? What, what is it about laughter that's medicinal? So there's lots of research. Laughter, we know we feel good. We feel mentally uplifted. And that's because there are endorphins and serotonin that's being released. 
If it's a full-on belly laugh, not just a little snigger, then it is aerobically active. William Fry from Stanford did a, um, some research and apparently worked out that 10 minutes on a, on a rowing machine is the equivalent of one minute full-on belly laughter when you're looking at it from an aerobic point of view. So you can really get good value exercise out of laughter. It unleashes inhibitors and it breaks barriers. It's great for communication because laughing is, you know, there are no separating out of, you know, sexes or peoples. You know, laughter and humour is a, a universally understood experience. It's great for team building, partly again because there is this sort of connectedness with laughter and laughter actually predates human language. And so people who look at the evolution of the human species say that laughter was used as a form of sort of bonding communication between early humans. And in actual fact, even in the animal world, there are versions of laughter with chimps, for example. And it, it tends to be a form of vocalisation which brings people together or animals together. Um, so great for team building, helps boost your immune system. Loads of really interesting studies, again, mostly in America, um, but some in Japan where they've had uh, people reading different magazines a comedy magazine versus a sort of a fighting magazine or a serious magazine and then they've looked at things like natural killer cells in their blood samples they use saving private ryan versus a comedy film i forget which and they looked at the levels of the natural killer cells and it was seen that you watch saving private ryan and your immunity goes down you watch something of humorous value and your immunity goes up so and this has been repeated these same sorts of studies so we know that it can boost your immune system Obviously it tones the muscles, which is why if you've had a good belly laugh, you will feel tummy achy. So the idea is that laughter yoga is using simulated laughing exercises. So you're not expected to laugh genuinely, or at least not to begin with. The, the motto is fake it, fake it until you make it. So you start with pretend laughing. And because essentially it's so silly, it can generate genuine laughter. It's helpful if you have eye contact, because when you're doing something silly and you've got eye contact, it spreads. Laughter is contagious, isn't it? If you use motion, again, that tends to help more. As you move around, it, it releases some of the inhibitions. I'm naturally a very shy and quiet person, so this is hugely stressful to do. But actually, once it gets going, for me, it's, it's unbelievable. And the movement can just help make it that much easier. You want to bring to it an element of playfulness. And as I say, fake it until you make it. The, the laughter yoga, the laughter is, you'll see, laughter exercises. The yoga is the kind of breathing that you use. So with, with yogic breathing, there's a lot of uh, breathing in through the nose, doing long exhalations for all of the physiological effects that that can bring. And when you laugh, you have a lot of forced expiration. Your diaphragm is kind of pumping away and you're having a forced long exhalation. You're tending to go into uh, wider than your tidal volume as well. So you're emptying out more oxygen than you normally would and bringing in more fresh oxygen. We normally do a full blown warm up and everything and some silly exercises. Within the exercises, we do some deep breathing. When we do the deep breathing, we take a breath in through our nose and we bring our hands towards our chest, clenching our fists. And as we breathe out, we're opening up the body. So it's giving us an element of a stretch as well. We have two chants, if you like. The first chant, we're clapping our hands and we're saying ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. And it starts to get the facial muscles doing the same kind of thing that you're going to do with laughter. The other kind of like a chant is very good, very good, yay, which is taking that kind of childlike playfulness. Children are just happy about everything. And if they do something well, even if it's just stand up well they they want to celebrate it and yay i'm so good and so this very good very good yay is just to uh, encourage us to be more silly and playful so we're going to move we're going to just do a couple of these deep breaths if anyone has got a hernia or or viruses or unstable angina please take it easy <laughs> otherwise it's safe so we're going to take a deep breath in and breathe out breathe in and breathe out. You're going to be copying and joining as best you can. We're going to start with very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, yay! The first pretend laugh we're going to do is a mobile phone laugh. So you're on the phone to your friend, they've just told you a funny story and it's so funny! You've got to laugh. It's so funny! This is 
swinging laughter. So it's a little bit like the hokey cokey. So we're going to come in with a Very good, very good, yay, indeed, I'm all for it. That was Sarah Sturman, physiotherapist with the Dorset Community Pain Service. And I suggest that you don't try laughter yoga whilst driving. Which brings me neatly to the small print, that whilst we in Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, here's something else that might have surprised you to find at a British Pain Society scientific meeting. If, like me, you can think of any number of benefits to not having pain, then a talk on the benefits of pain might have raised an eyebrow. Brock Bastian is a social psychologist working at the University of Melbourne in Australia. His area of research is into the relationship between pain and happiness. The key idea is that actually we need pain to be happy and, and it's very hard to experience any kind of happiness if you don't have some sort of contrasting experience. It's interesting to be at this conference because I'm not really talking about endless, chronic, terrible pain at all, in fact. You know, I sort of noticed that our view of pain is, is pretty much a, a blanket kind of pain equals bad. I guess I wanted to look at it in a more nuanced way and, and also re realise that yeah, it provides a very important contrast in life for the rest of our good experiences too. I mean the contrast thing is interesting because I think if you asked most people with chronic pain what their research subject would be, it wouldn't be pain and happiness, it'd be pain and misery. We've written a, a review paper looking at, it's called The Positive Consequences of Pain and we tried to work out what are the sorts of differences between what we're talking about and the sorts of pain where you wouldn't expect there to be any positive consequences. And I, and I think the, the key thing here is also to note that the title of the paper involves the word consequences. So it's, you know, what happens after pain a lot of the time? You know, pain has to stop. And that's, that's the key thing in all of the, the sort of work that we do. And I think that's probably the key difference between pain which can have some benefits, some upside, and pain which doesn't and that that is effectively whether or not it stops at some point or even if you know it will stop uh, i think if you feel that you're in, in endless pain or you are experiencing endless pain there's not very many benefits there so what message are you going to get across to these worthies of the british pain world we talk about a lot of different sorts of things that pain can do so we talk about the fact that often pain brings people together you know painful experiences are, are a very powerful driver of community and bonding and also cooperation. We've done some studies showing this. Painful experiences also lead people to often connect with each other through empathy or to seek out support um, or, or affiliation with others. So there's a lot of social sort of benefits there. The other sorts of benefits like the kind of offset and, and pain leading to increases sometimes in experiences of pleasure. But I suppose the, the bigger picture hopefully from all of the different bits and pieces of evidence is that you know it's worth just stepping back and, and taking a, a second look at the way we view pain. It's very hard to deal with something that if you see it as only bad. You know, if something is just this big black box of badness, it's very hard to know how to cope with that or what tools to use to, to regulate it or manage it better. And so in some ways, changing a viewpoint on pain, making it a more nuanced understanding rather than just this big black kind of cross and allowing people to, to look at it from different perspectives. And, and we, you know, we do know that managing anything from depression to pain to anything else, when you can look at it from different perspectives, it greatly enhances your capacity to manage even those unwanted pain. There's also some, you know, some very direct work showing that simply how people think about pain directly changes how they experience it. And so framing pain as positive, there is even some good work showing that you know, framing pain as positive reduces the amount of pain people experience that's actually right down at the biological level. It increases the, you know, the release of, um, of opioids and cannabinoids in, in response to pain. So there is a lot of emerging evidence that the way we think about our beliefs about pain, the way we frame pain, is fundamentally important for how we experience it. So if we frame pain as just this big bad thing, then that suggests that we're not doing a good job of understanding pain. And so if we could understand in a more nuanced way, see the bad, but also the good sides to it, surely that might then even help people who have unwanted pains, chronic pain, to, to think 
differently, take different perspectives to, to approach their pain management in new, maybe new ways I hadn't thought of before. That's a real glass half full attitude, isn't it? That, that you can use pain yeah. for meeting people, for getting together to yeah. discuss things. I mean, you, you know, yeah. the, the glass really is half full if you want to be like that. Well, that's right. That's right. And, you know, I mean, we never set out to compare pain to, to pleasure. We just wanted to see could good things come from pain. We didn't want to say that pain was necessarily better than pleasure. I mean, you would never want to say that. That would be a bit silly. But it is noteworthy that I think pain is sometimes a more powerful driver of these things. So you often see that, you know, for example, there's evidence showing that the levels of volunteerism after 9-11 in the United States spiked massively across the country, and not just for, you know, tragedy related causes for a whole range of causes people suddenly you know I was, I was in Brisbane in, in 2011 during the floods and you know there was some 55,000 volunteers turned up a big outpouring of I guess kindness and generosity and, and there was a real bonding there and you know I mean if anyone's from Australia you know Brisbane had won the uh, the state of origin multiple times which is a really big deal if you're from Sydney or Brisbane um, not so much if you're from Melbourne but if you're from Melbourne you go for Brisbane that was a great source of pride and, and I guess pleasure in some sort of way, but it didn't bond people in the way that the floods did. That's obviously not, we're not talking about physical pains, well, partly there, but and certainly we've, sh we've got work showing that the same things occur in response to physical pain. And I suppose also in group treatment for chronic pain, you would see these sorts of effects. I would presume, I don't know the evidence and I, don't, I haven't done the studies myself, but I, I presume that, you know, that sort of connection that people feel when they are enduring something difficult is often quite a lot deeper than if you're simply indulging in frivolous pleasure, I suppose. <laughs> the altruism, I mean, that's very interesting itself. But yeah. getting together with other people within yes. play, allowing yourself or mm. being given permission, if you like, to discuss with other people yes. openly is very, very good for you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a, it's a powerful short source of shared experience. And when you share experiences, you become more open and you know you connect more with people through shared experiences but pain is a particularly powerful one. It would be very interesting to find out how you get from that glass half empty feeling to get to the mm. half full thing where you can change a mindset you think well actually this pain isn't such a bad thing it could do me good. One of the other things that we talk about is uh, you know how sometimes pain can lead to I guess perceptions of virtue so often if you see you know sports people pushing through pain or doing something that's quite painful but they push through nonetheless they become heroes so often people who push themselves against you know pain overcome pain are seen as having certain sort of virtues and qualities even heroic sort of qualities but I think again I mean you know people who deal with high levels of chronic pain daily I mean that that may be a perception which if they deal well with that if they are coping even if they're not whatever I mean there is some perceived virtue there perhaps I, I know it also goes the other way often as well and 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 quickly too so it's very tricky with chronic pain, but I think, you know, those sorts of glass half full attitudes are much easier if the pain has an end, if, if you know that it's going to stop. So I think it's important to kind of put that caveat on it. But it could also be there, you know, if, if people are particularly sort of capable, it could be there for even chronic pain, I suppose. But I, I would imagine for myself, it'd be much easier to look at it positively if I knew it was going to stop at some point too. There's a big thing these days about measuring the well-being or the happiness mm. of, of a nation. Maybe they should be trying to measure the happiness and the misery of a nation. Mm. There was a move to measure the happiness in the UK. You know, I guess the flip side of the, the pain research is some of the other stuff that we do, looking at how valuing happiness, overvaluing happiness actually has the opposite effect often. When people feel pressured to be happy in life and, and you know, I guess in our largely Western, perhaps more broadly than just Western, but in our cultures today, you know, happiness is sort of heralded as, as a great virtue. And so when people feel that kind of pressure to be happy, it means that when you experience non-happy states like sadness, pain, depression, anxiety, that you actually feel in some way that you're failing in your life, that, you know, you should be happy. We all should be happy. And if we're not happy, then this is somehow a failure. But of course, it's, it's kind of a crazy notion because, you know, we evolved with all of these different emotional states. And in fact, the negative ones are the ones that kept us alive for all these years, not the positive ones. They're the more valuable ones, actually. But somehow we've, we've put this overlay of value of positive is good, negative is bad. And that's not a biological or an evolutionary thing that's just a simply a social thing that we, we decided that happiness was a, was a great place to be and we should all be happy and I suppose as soon as a should comes into that then people experience their pains and their and their sadnesses as, as, a, as a failure in life so yeah that work was um, I guess used to criticize um, this this move to to measure happiness in the UK 
as to whether it might actually have the opposite effect of, you know, I guess if you're in pain or feeling sad and, and your happiness levels go down, well, now it's a big bummer because not only are you unhappy, but you're bringing your entire nation's gross domestic happiness down as well. So. <laughs> That's Brock Bastian of Melbourne University in Australia. And I'd just like to point out that the UK Gross Domestic Happiness Index has not been affected in the making of this edition of Hearing Pain. So there we are. Now, staying with the voice or vocal expression, René Blomqvist is a researcher and medical anthropologist. Her interest in self-management and strategies for people with long-term conditions led her in what, to me anyway, was a surprising direction. I became really interested in stuttering and stammering and being unable to speak. And with the people I studied, that speaking and the way that they used their voice was a way for them to create their own identity and to create a sense of who they were. I don't quite understand that. The mm -hmm. way you say the way people use their voice mm -hmm. creates their identity. What do you mean by using their voice? If you think about people who, when they get nervous, can't speak, that feeds into them being unable to kind of project themselves into the world. And then when they learn through different breathing techniques and different kind of physical exercises to use their voice, that means that they can then project themselves into the world. So that means that they can be who they want to be or they can have a different sense of, of who they are. So these physical exercises of being able to use your voice kind of feeds into how you experience yourself in the world. You use the word normal, I think. Is it doing something different to conform to somebody else's view of what is normal? Yeah, that's quite possible as well. Let's say if you have a very squeaky voice, for example, and, and you're uncomfortable with that, being able to to shape your voice so that, well, yeah, I guess you can, you can question what's normal and not, but if, if you want to be normal, then experiencing yourself as abnormal would kind of have an effect on how you feel. So how does that relate to self-management? I think it relates to self-management in the way that if you're unable to do the things that you find normal, so if you're unable to stay up all night drinking with your friends, for example, because you know you're going to have a flare up the next day, then you have to sort of create a new identity. So for somebody, say, with a speech impediment or speech abnormality, mm. call it what you will, mm. that process of trying to conform or imagine what other people think of you mm -hmm. can hold them back. I mean, an example from one of the participants in my master's study, he'd gone through severe bouts of, of depression um, and that had really taken hold of his voice. He was so kind of drained that for him it just made him unable to speak to his friends or to his parents and he always used to sing but he couldn't speak so much and so for him being able to sing every morning kind of opened up his airways is how he described it he kind of he knew that if he didn't sing in the morning he wouldn't be using his voice the whole day so for him to have these practices of singing in the morning he described it as a bridge from his inner world to, to the outer world because he knows he has an impact on the outer world or the environment when he creates these sounds even today, he has a, a ritual of just singing in the morning because he f it makes him feel more confident, it makes him feel more present. That was researcher René Blomqvist. Now, what follows will demand your full cooperation and participation. Refusal to join in is not an option. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. How do you feel about doing some singing for your general health and well-being? general health and well-being. Yes, singing. singing. Singing is uh, good for health. It is very good for health. There is evidence that it's good for our psych psychological health, our mental health, but also our physical health as well. There are so many health benefits. You're so very and we're just doing a little workshop over there. If you'd like to join us for 10 minutes. I will. Yeah. Excellent. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. I am Anne Smith. I'm a specialist physiotherapist with the Dorset Community Pain Service. And I've been working with people with persistent pain for about 23 years now and I talk to them about singing and they're very keen. But the thing is you're used to dealing with patients. We're here at the British Pain Society annual scientific meeting yep. so you're trying to get health professionals into your singing group and now. How difficult is that? Very difficult because you know it's sort of do as I say not as I do. So I am going to keep smiling at people, trying to grab them. I'm going to talk to those people who are sat in my seats. Come on, to then. Make come sure on, then. let's go and get them. <laughs> Have you come for the singing workshop? Because uh, you're actually sitting am I in where I'm about to do a singing workshop. Well, that sounds I'd brilliant. Love you to stay. Mm. <laughs> we 
would you stay? I can't sing though. That's the drawback. Right, okay. Singing is so good for your general health and well-being. It is, isn't it? There are it's psychological, physi physiological benefits. Well, you can't sing with a mouthful though, can you? No. Well, <laughs> can't I persuade you to stay? <laughs> Because it's going to be such fun. We're going to move. We've been sat around too much this morning. We're going to move. Right. Okay. Well, all right. I'm game. You're game? Yeah. So that's three of us. And that's not the 20s, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay. How do you feel about no. coming and doing some singing for your general health and well being? Just for 10 minutes. No, I'm really camera shy. Extremely camera shy. I, read, I, can, I can help you with somebody who doesn't like who does like it. Who, who likes they it? Follow me. Follow you. Indeed. Oh, two good looking guys. Even better. 10 minutes out of your life. Come on. For your general well, health and well being. It's going to be there. really yeah. good. No, it doesn't matter. It's fun. It's good if you produce endorphins, you breathe, you improve your posture. It's good for so many things. Come this way. I'm dragging people, kicking and screaming. Yes, yeah, you can talk on what we're just over there where that gentleman sat. How to clear a room. <laughs> How to clear a room. Yes. Okay, guys, thank you so much for staying for my singing workshop. I am not a musician, I'm not an expert, I just love singing and I know the benefits are huge. Psychologically, physiologically, uh, mentally, there is research to show that it's so good for so many things. So we've only got a few minutes left now, so if you want to empty your mouths, because I don't want anybody choking, I don't have to do the Heimlich manoeuvre on anybody, and we'll just do a few little exercises first. So uh, if you like to just stand up for me. And we're just going to just shake out a bit. We've been sat far too long. Not good for us. We're not meant to sit around. Man was meant to move. And just a little bit of shoulder shrugging. Right, now we're going to do some breathing. Everybody know where their diaphragm is? Let's do two or three nice diaphragmatic breaths where you, you breathe in and you try to imagine that you're filling your tummy with air. So your tummy comes out as you breathe in. So breathe in. And out. So you're getting the air right down to the bottom of your lungs. And now just feel yourself stand really strong. Imagine that you're being pulled up from the, the ceiling, pulled up by a string there. Let your shoulders go down and relax. Okay. All right, now we're going to get those vocal cords working a little bit. We're just going to do some, make a noise like a siren. So we're going to start low. Mm, and we're going to go right up high and then come back down again. So are we ready? Get those vocal cords going, yeah? <laughs> Skeptical, ready? Mm. Now we're going to start singing. And we're going to start to do a little bit of a, a, not a tongue twister, but just to get the the enunciation right we're going to go up in a scale singing where are we going to go what are we going to do and i want you to really get your mouth going ready so we'll sweat where's a good note to start for you guys where are we going to go what are we going to do up where are we going to go what are we going to do where are we going to go what are we going to do? Get your mouth going. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And stop. And now another one. And this time we're going to sing out for joy. So, we, we with Gusto Champion, a tour friend. If I can get my voice above the singing, please don't forget that you can download all 100 plus editions of Airing Pain from Pain Concern's website, which is painconcern.org.uk. From Pain Concern's YouTube channel, just put Pain Concern and YouTube into your search engine, and Able Radio. Able Radio, no gaps, ableradio.com. Now, come on, all together. The champions of the world. Hey, and please give yourselves a massive round of applause. You are incredibly brave.
Dave, and I am incredibly grateful that you've made a, a, a woman in her 60s extremely happy. So thank you, guys. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you.